Have you ever shared an analogy, a metaphor, an image, or illustration based on an overall message that you wanted to convey, and it kind of backfired? <laughs> this is what's happening to the author of Matthew in this parable. See, there is a message he wants to convey, but the analogy, the metaphor, the example doesn't quite work. There are 10 girls, 10 bridesmaids, 10 virgins, 10 girls that have been trained all of their short life to follow a master, the groom, to be ready for their wedding. On their journey to meet the groom, the 10 unnamed girls realized that the groom was delayed. Sleep deprived from waiting for this master, the 10 girls become drowsy, their eyes opening and closing, opening and closing, their fight against tiredness, and the high hour of the evening was nearly over. All turned off their lamp and fell asleep. Suddenly at a distance, there is a shout. The groom is coming, the groom is coming. Oh Lord, the master is coming. Get up, get up, get up. We fell asleep. The groom is finally here. Wait, said one. I think our oil is not gonna be enough. What do you think? Yes, I think you're right, but don't worry. Let's ask one of the girls in the other group. Perhaps one of them can share a bit of oil and we can all continue on our journey. Hey, can you give me a little bit of your oil? Can you help a sister out? You know, if we all share, we might all make it to the banquet. Nope, another girl said. I am not sharing. Wait, what? It's just a bit of oil. No, you should have come prepared. I will not share. If we do, we run the chance of not having enough and not being ready for the groom. That means the party. You know what, so just another girl, why don't you just go now and buy some oil for your lamps? A group of five girls carried on the journey with their lamps trim, while the other group of five girls diverted, diverted their journey in the middle of the night on a most unlikely, unsuccessful endeavor to buy oil. When they came back, they, uh, they asked the groom to let them in, and he said, I do not know you. Now, the moral of the story, this is Matthew's point. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. I'm sorry, what? Like, if this is your point, but anyway. See, for some, there is no distraction in the passage. The message is clear for some of you. Be ready, be prepared, and the Lord will recognize you. For others whose very livelihood is reflected in this image, it's hard to focus so quickly on the ultimate message. See, when we use images, illustrations, metaphors, there is a chance that we may miss inadvertently or intentionally someone from the community. If we give this text to a group of women who have been victims of human trafficking or girls who were sold into sex slavery, the idea of 10 virgin girls, 10 virgin girls being groomed to wait for the master is disturbing and terrifying at best and death inducing at worst. Fear is at play here. The girls whose family did not give them extra oil in the moment of truth were more fearful of the reaction of the master that they miss the potential blessing of a God who is benevolent and offers grace and decided, I'm gonna go and get some oil. The girls who had more oil and had reserves were also afraid of not being able to fulfill their long-awaited assigned duties that instead of standing in solidarity with their, others, with their other sisters, they send them away on a wild goose chase, knowing they were probably not going to make it. Sounds familiar? The unintended image that Matthew is sending women is that first, a man can already depict us and cast us in a binary. Good, bad, wise, foolish. I'm not making this up. I just read it, just to say. <laughs> Matthew is so focused on this, on his agenda, that he includes one of two other stories where nameless women are illustrated as symbol of admonishment to the, to the faith community. 
Seriously? Like, seriously. <laughs> time after time, example after example, Jesus' message is about welcoming radical hospitality, yet in this story, added by Matthew and not found in any other synoptic gospel, there was a hermeneutical decision to include this story and put women at us with each other. The disturbed beauty of this story is that it must have been conventional wisdom that girls were at the bottom of the social strata, that they were disposable with no voice, no say. Otherwise, this story would not have rung true in those days. Otherwise, some members of the community would have spoken up. See what I'm saying? In 2019, the story evokes multiple and various visceral responses, steers various interpretations, and invites different voices to be lifted and heard. As women who have been trained in seminary and divinity schools, as leaders who are responsible for embodying a different reality than the, sta than the current status quo around us, we must be responsible, imaginative, and inclusive of multiple voices by adding conversational partners to our texts and our exegetical work. We cannot, we must not continue blindly accepting orthodox theologies that turns us against each other and dividing and divides us among ourselves. Or worse, normalizing orthodox theologies to women who don't look like us or we don't like and only worry about the issues when it hits close to home. If you're not following, let me give you a short example. Since the beginning of the slave trade, white male colonialism set aside, made, and instructed that God created black women's bodies as sexual beings, as vessels of white male depravity, as objects of constant accessibility where rape was the norm of the day, where our wombs were used as economic commodity to increase the financial capital of plantation owners. Black women's bodies were never ascribed the construct of virginity because virginity was equated with goodness, ladylike, well-behaved, and our curves, skin color, and all that makes us wonderful, beautiful black women in all our fullness were exclusively considered disposable. It was not until 1965 that a court tried and convicted a white male from raping and violating a black woman. Did you hear me? Because, you know, your accents might get in the way. In 1965, for the first time, this country recognized that raping, violating, and accessing black women's bodies is punishable by law. Yet somehow, a Me Too movement is just catching up a few decades later. Fear. Fear gets in the way. Fear gets in the way when you feel like you have made it and you don't want to, rel to relinquish your elusive power. Fear gets in the way when feelings of guilt, when thoughts of we are not enough paralyzes us because we can't live up to the societal constructs of the perfect woman and instead of listening to the wild child, we, not, we end up listening to the confusing, uninterested, and unloving voices that tells us go away, go on your own. Fear gets in the way when we are more concerned and afraid with someone telling us, I do not know you, than being the trailblazers that God calls us to be. See, all ten girls fell asleep. Did you all read this scripture with me? All ten fell asleep. Not one, not two, not three, not five. All ten fell asleep. Now, if the ultimate message is to stay awake, then why the, sorry, the why five were punished only? The subliminal message is that those who follow the rules, which means that they follow the destiny, the destiny that's socially imposed to them, are then considered good girls, good leaders. It is important to break away from the constrictive mainstream norms that from the beginning of any conversation already puts us at us with each other, ascribing labels in service of male colonialism. The question becomes, how do we live out our call to stay awake? Or I will translate to stay engaged. This is not a mere, let's keep our eyes open. 
It's a call to stay engaged, stay in the game. That is the question. How do we remain engaged in the work and for work of and for the kingdom, not kingdom, the work for justice, the work for peace? How do we self-reflect in the ways we are complicit in perpetrating practices, values, and ethics that keeps invisible a sector of our community and give others too much visibility? How do we stay engaged in the day in and day out hard work of bringing God's reign into this world? How do we manage our fear, our apathy, our vocation to lies and mediocrity? How do we wake ourselves up from the anesthetized state in which we live in. We are anesthetized by pursuit of amalgamation of wealth, of obtaining security, of our purchasing power, increasing our social capital, how many friends, Facebook friends we have, how many tweets we post, how many Instagrams, selfies, yes? Stay engaged in the true real work of justice and peace. It seems that we have created a world where it is more motivating to strive and work towards status and security than to dismantling and holding our politicians, pastors, presidents, and leaders accountable. We are quick to turn a blind eye to the social issues that affect us all and more engaged with the appearance of doing something. Now, if you didn't get the first example, I'm going to give you another one. For years, the dr drugs infested and affected black and brown communities. Yet the response by society was to label us as lazy, we all have a natural disposition to violence, and we are immoral people. Now to squash the immoral sector of society, the only solution was to declare war on crime. Not making this up. Now, fast forward to 2017, to now, there is another drug problem. But wait, it has another name. It is labeled opioid epidemic. See, I can continue, but I think you get what I'm saying. We are so busy buying into the lie of a theology of scarcity that anything new, different, and not circumscribed to our norms is a threat and must be eliminated, diminished, sent away, not recognized. My sisters, the God we serve, praise, and worship does not operate on a BS theology of scarcity. God tells us, I've come so that you all can have life and life abundantly. Life to all, not just some. Do I need to read this again? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to read this again. My sisters, the God we serve, praise, and worship does not operate on a BS theology of scarcity. God tells us, I've come so that you all can have life and life abundantly. Life to all, not just some. I believe this text is a wake-up call. A wake-up call and an invitation to dig deeper, to think critically about God's overall message in the person of Jesus Christ manifested through the Holy Spirit. This text is an invitation to be responsible with the images we use or are attached to. This passage calls us today to bring about to the world an alternate reality where love, compassion, peace, and respect are the norms. We are reminded today through this passage to love God and love our neighbors as ourselves. But wait, we must learn to love ourselves. First step, love ourselves. Stop being afraid. Stop letting fear get in the way. For the sake of the kingdom, stop with the binaries and divisions. Stop with useless comparisons. Stop coveting what God hasn't given you. Focus on the gifts God has bestowed upon you. If you have a lamp full of different fragrant oils, be always engaged to use them for the sake of the work of justice and peace. If you have one or less variety of the fragrant oils, do the same. You're still a child of God. This is not a competition. It is an invitation to radical hospitality, to imagine ourselves, not by what society has boxed us in, but, what God, but how God has created us to be. Darkness can cloud our judgment like the 10 girls in the middle of the night. But the inner light 
pumped by the Holy Spirit day in and day out, demands of us to be and do differently. How will you be and do differently in your current vocational location? How are you living out your baptismal vows? A life with God, a vocation of leadership, is a life of faithfulness, service, and constant engagement. Yes, we will get tired. Yes, we will need rest. But guess what? God will send us sisters along the way to give us respite. Will you be so caught up by fear of not being perfect, the best, the popular one, that you will miss God's blessing of asking a sister out for help? God calls us to leave, to serve, and lead with love, grace, and respect in the same way that God has done so with each and every one of us. If we learn something about Matthew's short-sighted vision is that God requires of us way more. We must stay engaged. Our daughters, our granddaughters are looking at us. They are not necessarily listening to our beautiful words, but they are sure listening to the embodiment of our commitment to our faith, God, and to each other. We are no prudent, foolish, bridesmen, virgins, good or bad, all of that red herring BS. We are beloved women of the Creator who keeps waiting for us to embrace our beauty in all its shapes and forms. The party, the, party, the table, the feast awaits us. How are we truly going to feast with one another if in the moment of truth we let fear take over instead of letting God be God? Leadership is hard, I get it. It's freaking hard. It's hard for some of us. At the same time, it's fun, exciting, and full of possibilities. Therefore, let us remember that God is reminding us today that we don't serve alone. We have each other. And God is the one who calls us every day. Don't let fear get in the way. Let it inspire you to act. Let's embody an imaginative, trailblazing leadership, considering God's grace, love, compassion, and respect. Let's use our bodies and dance through the difficulties of life and leadership together. Let us create, let us create spaces where there is always enough. Everyone is welcome, and my neighbor is me and I am her. May God help us, may it be so. Amen.